Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program... Uh, getting confessional, getting upset. Getting to the deep stuff, courtesy of the band Bonds of Mara. But why spend time talking about talking about it? Let's get straight to the action. Hey, Denny boy! Roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, yes. It's Saturday night, kids, and I'm upset because for the second time in a week, I've just watched my team give up a late goal and not win the game. And that happened catastrophically for Arsenal earlier this week, playing in the Europa League against Olympiacos. A two-legged elimination tie, and they came home from Greece with a 1-0 lead, and somehow managed to lose the tie, courtesy of a late goal that gave Olympiacos a draw in leg two, and a win on away goals, and it's not easy to be an Arsenal fan right now, okay? The last couple of years, rough. This year, particularly rough. So when you watch the team with legitimate hopes of winning the Europa League and getting therefore promoted to the Champions League, where they rightfully belong... And then you watch them throw it away in such dreadful circumstances after all of the accumulation, the accumulation, kids, of darkness over the past three years, and you watch them throw that away so carelessly, and then you rest for a few days, right? You try to get that out of your system as best you can, because you know that Saturday night, Toronto FC will play its first game of the new Major League Soccer season. You can put yourself behind TFC because they actually win things, or at least come close. And don't they go into San Jose tonight? It's Saturday. It's Saturday as I'm recording this because I have such a rich and fulfilling social life. Last time around it was Friday. Today it's Saturday. Here I sit. Having just watched TFC go up 2-0, 2-0 on San Jose, in San Jose, TFC almost never wins in the West, playing away, and here they go with a 2-0 lead in the second half, and I watched them give one back, 2-1, and then, don't they get all the way to the last second of injury time? Give away kind of a weak foul on the edge of the box. And doesn't this San Jose dude step up and hit the free kick of a lifetime to tie the game at two? It's starting to get to me, kids. All right, the football is starting to get to me because my teams keep blowing it. And you invest so much. And I don't know why. I don't know why. It's stupid. It's tribalism, and it harkens back to some primal thing. But the problem you have is, if you're into a team, you live and die with the team. And my teams are doing a lot of dying. I don't even want to mention your Montreal Canadiens, who have been varying shades of mediocre since they won the Cup in 1993. 93, kids. Come on. And they've been basically crap ever since. They remain crap. Arsenal is a shambles. And TFC, God love them, just threw away the match on the final kick of the game. So I'm drinking as a result and as a response 
a little snifter, a teple, a wee teple of the Wolfhead coffee whiskey. Now, Ken the Zen and I, when we were in Texas, sampled the Jim Beam vanilla whiskey, and that was dangerously good. And here I have this Wolfhead coffee whiskey, and it is exactly as you would expect, a whiskey infused with coffee to give it uh, kind of a dessert quality. Now, I got into the post-dinner kind of liquors when I was at a resort a few years ago. The thing about going to a resort, at all-inclusive, is that the stuff is free, so you can sample whatever it is you want to sample. And in my case, I thought I'd get into sampling the brandies, sampling the cognacs, a little bit retro, a little bit old school, like they did on the Titanic. These sort of swell dudes from classy eras gone by would have a brandy after dinner. They would have a cognac. And I'm here to tell you, kids, that... A cognac and a brandy are fundamentally the same thing. They are made from white wine. The distinction is that your cognac has to actually be made in the cognac... That sounded a little bit Spanish, not Francais. In the cognac region, I gather, of France. So, I like the cognac. Ken the Zen and I sampled some of that as well in the, in the Texas and our little trip down there. and quite satisfying, so I don't have any of that in the house right now. I'm not a regular consumer of the libations, but on a Saturday night after my team blew it, and I got to do a solo podcast, not a bad time to try the coffee whiskey, so I recommend the Wolf Head. All right, I'm looking at the bottle now. It's classy. One of my favorite things about the liquors is the bottles, actually. I just think the bottles are cool, man. So I'm going to tell you what the wolf head says. This is the premium small batch coffee whiskey, a unique style of double barrel whiskey and cold brewed Costa Rican coffee, carefully blended by our in-house barista, who must be something else. Maximizing the aroma, we've created a liqueur that is smooth in flavor and strong in character. Stay wild! I don't know how wild coffee whiskey is, guys. Whiskey can be, and I'm a big proponent of the Forty Creek. If you're in Canada, get your hands on the Forty Creek. Whiskey, very, very smooth. Copper pot. Copper pot is excellent. But I like this wolf head, and I'm drinking it now because I'm mad at TFC, and I'm mad at sports, kids. It's been a rough time in sports for your boy, so, man. Where is the divinity in all of that, you ask? coffee whiskey. Where indeed the divinity tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the little prayer I say before each episode, whether I'm taping an interview, whether I'm sitting down in my little studio on a Saturday night, I ask the ether to bring forth the divinity in this podcast. And I don't know if there's been any so far, because my partisan sports watching is getting in the way, but hopefully some of that will come out. And how are you doing anyhow? I want to tell you, I'm so grateful. Thank you for all of the kudos on the last solo show, The Five Things. Received some lovely feedback from that. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're back here again doing it because I like the solo sounds. And we're going to talk more about this as we go on, about this allowing and about uh, about this letting things happen, you know, and following the trails where they lead. But before that, I got to make a confession. I haven't just been upset about the football the football's been a primary upsetter. I don't even get upset about the Habs anymore. For you Europeans, that's the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, it's been so lousy for so long that I barely pay attention anymore. I, I've, to be perfectly honest, become rather bored with hockey. I gotta be honest. Far more interested in footy these days. Far more interested in the Premier League. 
and what goes on in Europe. And uh, so I, I, I don't drink coffee whiskey because of the Montreal Canadiens. TFC will drive you to it. And if you've been a TFC for, fan for a long time, I salute you because you've seen the worst of the worst. You've also seen the best of the best. And we have had some glory, but man, there was 10 or 12 years of just garbage. And so it hurts, man. It hurts when you see the team throw it away. But that's not what's got me going here. I'm upset about the country music. This is hard for me to say, people. This is hard for me to talk about, kids. Because I am not... It's not even that I'm not a country music fan. I'm outwardly hostile towards country music, okay? And I'm talking about your bro country, all right? I'm talking about your songs about tractors and a cold beer and you look so good in your blue jeans and your dirt roads and your pickup truck. And you've heard these songs because there's thousands of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them. And they're all the same. And they're terrible. And uh, I have outright hostility. They actually technically make me angry. They're a trigger for me. In that voice, you all know that voice. Half those dudes don't even talk with an accent, so why? Anyways, I'm upset. And you may ask yourself, why, drummer boy, if you're so hostile to the country music, did you accept a sub gig whereby you're going to play with the band that plays the bro country music? Well, I'm a working musician. And by definition, a working musician's got to work. And so when a gig comes along with what is actually a cool band and some really great dudes, and uh, the price of admission is that you've got to play some of this really bad music, Sometimes you got to hold your nose and do it, but the problem I'm getting into and what's getting me upset is that I'm starting to like playing some of it. Oh. This wasn't supposed to happen. Now look, I'm not talking about the alternative country music, okay? I'm not talking about some of that music, which is more maybe Tex-Mex, not your Bible Belt, blue jeans and a cold beer, but that alt country, your Gillian Welches, your Kathleen Edwards, your Melissa McClelland. Melissa, Melissa, did you listen to the episode with your sister, Katie? A, it was outstanding and she's awesome. B, you're supposed to be calling me to play with you. You, Melissa McClellan, and Sarah Harmer are supposed to be calling me to play with you, and here I sit, awaiting those calls. But I'm not talking about Lucinda Williams, and I'm not talking about Kim Ritchie, some of these really terrific kind of Americana, uh, alt-country artists, right? And I've played a lot of that stuff, because I was, for quite a while, the drummer in Lindsay and the Lonelies, which was a brooding dark, mysterious alt-country band, and we cut what I think is a fantastic record called Lonely is a Dirty Word. And yeah, technically it's country, but it's desert country, man. Get it. There's desert country, Americana, and there's bro country, pickup trucks and short shorts and blue jeans and all that garbage, right? I'm not talking about the alt-country. Really like the alt-country right? Really liked playing it. I liked recording songs that were in that flavor. And um, I really like a lot of that music, but the bro country drives me up a freaking wall. And there's that tune about she thinks my tractor's sexy. Now I'm not into bagging on people. Now what I'm trying to do, but a line was crossed for me when I heard that one at my salon. Which, if you look at my photos, you know I don't go too often, but my salon plays the country station sometimes, and it's all I can do not to jab the scissors into my ears. Um, the She Thinks My Tractor's Sexy tune came on, and that was just about enough for me. You almost lost my business on that one. 
So I'm playing this music, but as I said, I'm starting to like playing some of it. And I want very much to call that evolution. I want to call that growth. It's probably not, and it's upsetting me. Uh, this band I'm playing with does a lot of covers, and in particular, I've been listening to Chris Young. Okay? They cover a couple of Chris Young songs, and I like playing them, and it upsets me. And I like playing them because, actually, melodically, they're good. Ugh! They're good, and the tempo's in my wheelhouse, like it sits in my pocket. And I found myself practicing these songs and actually playing them with emotion, and that says to me that they're reaching me on a musical level at least. And it's upsetting, kids. It's upsetting! So I'm just airing that to you. I want this show to be honest, you know. And I'm confessing to you right now that I actually like some of this music. And, uh, well, I don't know what to say, but it, some of it I don't. But some of it I do. And when that happens, you begin to question everything about yourself. And you drink coffee, whiskey on a Saturday night. And you think, this is probably the end for me. Something has changed here that's fundamental and it's not okay. Anyways. I needed to get that off my chest, and I appreciate you listening to me talk about the fact that I actually like playing some of this music. And the show will probably be really good. And I might even wear blue jeans. I don't know. I don't know. It's upsetting. It's upsetting, but you know, this is supposed to be a spiritual podcast. It's supposed to be a motivational podcast. And I guess if there's a lesson in all of that, it's that you should be open. You know, you should take things at face value and you should take them without putting everything in one package. All right? A lot of that bro country I hate. I'm going to keep hating it, whether I play it or not. But you have to accept that one thing is not all things. And so some of the songs I think are okay. And I actually enjoy. And maybe you need to bring that approach to everything in life. Instead of categorizing things, instead of stereotyping things, instead of putting things in a box, take them as they are, song by song, artist by artist. And you find good things in that. Okay? That's maturity, right? That's growth. So I guess my lesson is be a little more open. <sighs> And as a working player, you sometimes have got to play stuff that isn't necessarily your bag, but you can find a way, you need to find a way to infuse yourself into it. Music is an emotional thing. Music is a personal thing. Music is notes on a page, but that's mechanics, okay? If you're going to play something well, whether that's a bro country tune or a metal tune, or a jazz tune, you've got to connect to it in some way. You have to find something in it. And so this is a good exercise in that, right? I'm learning that that's important. So if you're a, a generalist like I am, and you're a hired gun like I am, then you've got to find a way to like everything. You've got to find a way to have some emotional connection to everything you do, because if you cut yourself off, how many country gigs are there, kids? Seriously, how many country gigs are there? That is a, a world where music is still happening. And that is a world where people still go to shows, you know? So if you automatically shut yourself off from that because I don't like that music, that's not what I do, then, you know, you're missing out on a whole lot of opportunities. So for me... It's like, okay, find a way, find a reason. And I'm actually beginning to like playing some of the songs. And that, you know, potentially opens up a whole world of opportunities that I haven't really been in to this point. And, you know, if you're playing music for a living, dude, you've got to be in as many places as you can be. You've got to play as many different styles as you can play. And so that's a big one. And I'm dipping my toe in it. 
So the advice to you is to be open, kids. And if you're a musician, man, be open to genre. Be open to things that maybe you don't like to listen to, but you can find a reason to play well and play with some attachment. And, you know, the opportunities are there. So I'm hoping that me learning some of these songs maybe opens up opportunities for gigs because I need them because I need them because I need them because you can be a touring player and it's great when you're touring, but when you're not touring, what are you doing? And if you've got that in your wheelhouse, more opportunity for you to stay afloat as a player. So that's how I'm looking at it. Let's not speak of it again. Let's move into something more up my alley. I am two days out now from having attended a concert in my city of London by the band Bonds of Mara. Now you know Bonds of Mara. If you've been listening to the show, you know that uh, somewhere in the, in the first 15 episodes, I interviewed my old high school friend Dave Benedict. And Dave Benedict is the bass player from Bonds of Mara. Now, go and listen to that episode. Because it's super inspirational. And it's interesting. Now, Dave is, slash was, the bass player in the top-selling, chart-topping band Default. And you remember them from the early 2000s, Wasting My Time, Arena Tours, the whole thing. Big deal. Big band. And it kind of fell apart at a certain point. Most bands do, you know. And Default went away for a while. Dave went away for a while, and, you know, that was a rough, dark, difficult period of his life, but he resurfaced recently, default resurfaced, playing some festivals, playing a few shows here and there, not nearly the tour schedule they used to have, but they resurfaced, and along the way, Dave hooked up with some dudes from other very high-profile rock and roll bands that did extremely well, and together they created the band Bonds of Mara. Kind of a Canadian rock and roll early 2000s supergroup. And they accounted for a lot of hit music and a lot of, uh, a lot of records sold between them. So we have members of My Darkest Days. We have members of Hail the Villain. Sons of Butcher, and of course, Default. And man, I I just want to tell you straight up, now that I know more about them, now that I've seen them live, I got so much respect for this band and for the dudes in the band. And I'm going to tell you why. Because these guys were bus touring bands. These guys were in arena bands. These guys are used to playing big, big rooms for big, big crowds and having the whole rock star trip, all right? They made it. They had number one singles. They had huge selling records. These dudes were legit stars in big bands. And those big bands went away. And these guys went through personal stuff. I'm going to talk about some of that in a minute. And here they are on a Thursday night in London with this new project they put together, building it from the ground up. Starting at the bottom again, kids. For the love of music. And I respect that like you wouldn't believe because I know how hard it is to get a thing off the ground. And I also know how hard it is to go back and start a new thing after you've already built the thing off the ground. Now, I've never built anything to bus tour number one single arena shows level. Someday, I'm hoping, I'm still holding out hope for something like that. But I've just built things up to being a popular local indie band that people come to see. Starting at zero and working your way up with Hiroshima Hearts in particular to, you know, at least opening big rooms, if not headlining them, you know, playing high-profile shows, going through that years-long process of driving places and playing to nobody, and then driving places and playing to 10, and then driving places and playing to 20 the next time, doing that in my own city, 
trying to release music, trying to get it reviewed by people, trying to build an audience. And it's a years long process. And I think about it now. I think, man, could I start at the bottom? Not even at the bottom. Could I start at zero again with a new project and go through the process of having no music and writing the music and then rehearsing the music and then reaching a point where we can play a show and then beginning all of this work all over again? Having reached the modest heights that I've reached, what's it like for people who have reached the highest heights that those guys have reached? To humble yourself, to start again, to put in the work. And there were about, I don't know, maybe 40 people at this gig. These dudes are used to playing for thousands, kids. There's maybe 40 people at this gig, you know? And these guys are up on stage crushing it. So much energy, so tight, so well rehearsed, extremely professional, just killing it up there for this little tiny club crowd, you know, and doing it with the kind of enthusiasm and with the kind of energy and with the kind of spirit that they would have done it the first time around with their other bands that made it 20 years ago or whenever that was. And you got to respect that. And at a certain point, they're on stage and they're like, we really appreciate you coming. We got 40 people this time. Next time there'll be 200. And I love that attitude, man. And it's instructive. It's instructive for anybody who tries to build anything, particularly for musicians, because we live in this world now where everybody wants to be an American Idol. Everybody wants to fast track Everybody thinks you go from zero to a single and a bus tour. People don't want to do the legwork. People don't want to build from the ground up. They want to be at the top right off the bat. And for 99.9% .9 of the people, it doesn't happen like that. And it's a lot of people fall away because we've been playing for two months. How come we're not headlining arenas right now? How come nobody's throwing a bus at us? You know, people don't want to put in that grind. And these dudes, having done the grind, having reached it, having got there, willing to go back and do the grind again. And looking at it with that right attitude. 40 people this time, 200 next time. Might not be 200 next time. Might be 60, might be 75. Depends on how their radio work goes, I suppose. But I love this humble, willing attitude. And I love the work that goes into this. And I love what these guys represent. Now, the guitar player is Sal Costa, all right? And this dude is a wise dude, and he's done some living. Now, go on the YouTubes and look up Sal's TED Talk, because this is a guy who walked away, all right? This guy was in My Darkest Days. You remember the big song, Porn Star Dancing, Chad Kruger screaming in the background. Big, big song, kids. Huge song. Sal Costa was a legit, still is, but Sal Costa was a legit rock star in a legit rock star band. Okay? And he lived his whole life aspiring to that working towards that, dreaming of that, and then he got there and was miserable, kids. Got there and was miserable, kids. Now you look at his TED Talk and he's going to talk about reaching rock bottom, reaching a certain point where he, he needed medication to go on stage and eventually had a straight-up panic attack and ran away, and literally and figuratively ran away, and he quit. He just stopped. Couldn't take it anymore. Totally lost himself in rock star world, where there's drugs everywhere, where there's booze everywhere, where there's fake people everywhere, where you're just getting pulled in eight zillion directions, and you're tired. 
Even at my modest level, I understand the tired part. The road is exhausting, and when you get to that level, everything is just so amplified. And you find yourself there, and you find yourself in the dream that you've dreamed your whole life. And you're miserable. How many times have you heard about this? How many times have you heard about the people who finally made it in Hollywood? And it's empty. It doesn't fulfill them the way they thought it would. And then they go off the rails, man. It happens to everybody. Not everybody. It happens in all areas of celebrity. It happens to people in all walks of life. They get there and it doesn't fill the hole. It doesn't fill the void. And that happened to Sal. And he walked away from music. And he went back and he started working in a restaurant. Started cooking. And through that, began to rediscover himself. Began to rediscover his creativity, his passion for things, you know? But he had to hit a rock bottom. And it was over. And it was the same for Dave Benedict in Default. And he will tell you about that if you go listen to the interview we did together, where Default was huge, man. And then it was just over. And you got bills to pay. And there's no income stream anymore. And there's nothing happening in music. And Dave burned out, too. Dave reached this level where it just burned out. And the whole band burned out. And they went away. And then what are you? Who are you when that happens? When you have this identity as a rock star that you spent your life chasing and cultivating. And then it's just gone. Who are you in that moment? And it's easy to fly apart. It's easy to become a bitter, sort of twisted kind of person who expects the world to still treat you the way you are accustomed to being treated, to be fond over, for things to be easy, for things to come to you. But when it's over, it's over. But Dave went back to school as a mature student and became a graphic designer and started channeling himself into that. But I was talking to him at the show first time I've seen him since high school, and it was really cool. Now, Dave's a hat guy, and if you know me, you know that I'm a hat guy. The difference between Dave and me is that he wears the hats outside of the store, and I have not come to that yet. Look great in the hats in the store. Can't quite get the hat outside the store. But Dave's a legit rock star, so he can get away with the hats in a way that I can't, because I'm an illegit rock star, meaning not one at all. I play a lot. Far from a rock star. Dave's legit. He can wear the hats. We're talking after the show, right? And he talked to me about how he didn't even play bass for five years. What? His band fell apart. The whole thing fell apart. It was over. And he just quit playing. He was disillusioned, was somewhat jaded, needed to make the rent, had a wife and a family, got bills to pay. And he walked away from music. He figured it was over. Quit playing his bass. Done. And then he he told me he couldn't understand why he was so miserable all the time. Isn't it amazing to not understand why you were miserable? Because music was out of your life. Now, I've known Dave since we were 12, 13 years old. And all through high school... He was like me. Music. Music is life. That's the way it was for me. It's the way it was for him. The difference between him and me is that he had the courage to pursue it, and it took me another 20 years to develop that courage. So kudos to you, Dave Benedict. And he went off and he did it. And this was his whole life. Music was his whole life, as it was mine for a long time. And then all of a sudden, it's just gone. Is it any wonder you're miserable? You're not playing anymore. And the the thing is, you can become accustomed. I'm speculating because I'm not there yet. But you can become accustomed to a certain level of experience in the business, right? You can become accustomed to playing big rooms for thousands of people and having hit songs on the radio and having the people around you, and having that elevated, kind of accelerated, amplified experience in the music business. But the fundamental is, you love to play music, right? So there are lots of people, most of them actually, who are perfectly content to just play on the weekends, 
and have a day job and a family and a life and all those things. The thing is the playing. The thing is the give and take of playing with other people. It's the performing. It's having that experience because it's who you are. You know, it's, it's a fundamental. It's a part of you. It's not even a hobby. It's an expression of you for those of us who are kind of immersed in music at that level. The thing is the playing. Now, you hope that the playing takes you somewhere. That's kind of gravy. And some of us are lunatic enough, mental enough, to want to try to make a living from it. Difficult thing to do. But the fundamental is still the playing, right? And, you know, somebody like Dave spent years and years and years and years and years just doing that. My friend Monty Colvin of Galactic Cowboys tells the same story. You know, 10, 12 years as a full-time guy in a band, and then it's over, and then whoosh. You know? Is it any wonder you're miserable? This is not in your life anymore, but Dave wasn't making that connection. But then, something happened to Dave, something happened to Sal, something happened to the other guys in the band, where it's like, hey, they began to put out feelers toward each other. How do you feel about just getting together to mess around? The playing, the playing part. How about we just get together and play a little bit and see if anything happens? And they began to do that, and they congregated from different parts of the country. And it's like, hey, call that guy. Let's get this guy in. Let's try this. Let's try that. And they get back into the studio, and they get back into grassroots level, like where it all began. And they began to get this chemistry going and they begin to feel it again in ways that they hadn't since I'm willing to wager since their big bands were starting at that level. Once you get success, weird pressure starts to happen. You know, I think a lot of the, in some cases, the enjoyment maybe goes out of it. That kind of innocent playing for the love of music goes out of it. And then you got like pressures, like there's money on the line and there's management and there's you know, pressure to knock out singles and to be on the radio and to grow and things become a business very rapidly. And I think when things become a business, it's not hard for them to really become a lot less fun. I think the business squeezes the fun out of it for a lot of bands and that's too bad, but that's life. And that's kind of the price of success. But here's these guys back at grassroots level No pressure, no expectations, just playing, just bringing the playing back in. And what happens is there's this chemistry, and they begin to write songs together, and they begin to realize there's something in this. And let's push forward with it. Now, as Dave said, he didn't play his bass for five years, but then this began to happen, and he began to pick it up again, and he began to rekindle that passion, that fire, that connection he had with the instrument and with music and with the industry. And he said something super profound, and I don't even think he knows it's profound, but he said it was like, why resist it? Why resist it? And that is so instructive. It's instructive for me. It's instructive for you. It's instructive for him. Things are happening. Things are nudging. Go on my website. There's at least one blog entry about nudges, about these little pushes from the universe that say, look at this, try that, explore this. And then a lot of times you just resist that for whatever reason. For me, most recently, it's resisting solo podcasting. Why? Why resist it? I know it works. They're not fabulous. They're not polished, these episodes, but I know they work. I'm doing it right now. And I have had enormous resistance to allowing that because lots of reasons. Because I started off as an interview show, because I'm good at interviewing people. And so I should do that. And because It feels a little bit silly to talk to yourself for 45 minutes or an hour and then put it on the internet. And it feels pretentious and it feels self-important. And there's lots of good reasons for me to not do that. And I also know that it kind of works, but you resist. And as Dave says, why resist? If there's flow in a thing, if there's repeated encouragement in a thing, why 
resist it. Go with that. One of the biggest things in my life right now is learning to go with things, learning to let life happen, get out of your own way. And Dave must have felt some resistance to this because jaded by the music industry, because it's so much work to get something off the ground. Dude, it is an enormous amount of work to get something off the ground. And with these guys, these are pro players, man. These are serious cats. Getting something off the ground for them is not probably the same as getting something off the ground for a lot of the rest of us. Because when these guys think of a project, they think, let's get it on the radio. Let's headline a cross-country tour with only two singles released. These guys think bigger game. And the reason they think bigger game is because that's their level. That's their experience in the business. That's what they know is possible. And it's somewhat easier for them in the sense that they've been through it and they know people and they know how to make it happen. They know how to fast track things, but it still takes an incredible amount of work, you know, but they did it. They felt enough joy in what they were doing and they felt enough chemistry in what they were doing and they sensed the divinity in what they were doing and Dave learned to not resist it. Just let it come, because this is who he is, man. He's a musician. And you need that in your life. Whatever it is you are, you need that in your life. Maybe you were an athlete, okay? And you're 48 now, and you're miserable, and you don't know why. Because you work your job, and your kids are fine, and you got your house, and whatever. That's the, you know, best case kind of scenario. But you're miserable deep down inside. Why? Because you're missing whatever it was you got from being an athlete. You haven't played pickup hockey in 10 years or softball or whatever, you know? Look at that. Look at what you used to do that was who you are that you no longer do. There's gold in that. There's happiness in that. There's fulfillment in that. There's an energy in that that can only be lit by doing it. There's a fire in everyone, kids. All right? There's a fire in everyone. Maybe you're a poet. Maybe you used to draw. Maybe you're a painter. Maybe you haven't painted in 17 years because you took a drawing class and... The teacher said something disparaging about a sketch you did. But you'd been drawing for 10 years before that, happily sketching away in your notebooks. And you stopped doing that because of something somebody said, or it felt silly, or you put this huge pressure on yourself to make a living. And you stopped doing it, and you're miserable now. You're cold now. You're cold, kids, because the heat... The spark, the energy, the fire is in that thing you do that you no longer do. Maybe that's what Dave was feeling, you know, a resistance to doing that. But he's like, why resist it? So he flowed with it. He went with it. And now here we go. Dave 2.0, Bonds of Mara, song on the radio, touring across the country, playing to 40 like the old days. Riding in a van like the old days. Probably eating McDonald's like the old days. Doing it again. But you can tell from all those dudes that they love it. And they're glad they're back. You know? And this vehicle that they've chosen, this Bonds of Mara band, they love it. They're having a great time. And when you bring that kind of approach, when you bring that kind of energy into the thing you're doing, which is pure love, man, which is doing it for pure love. And yeah, okay, when you're at their level, there's a business angle, but man, they appreciate, I'm guessing, more than ever, that peculiar chemistry, that deep, deep satisfaction that comes with playing well with people you like and doing it for the right reasons and hoping, 
hoping for it to turn into something, but I suspect not needing it to. And when you approach things that way, man, and let them unfold, do the work, take the steps, be serious about it, but let go of the results, let them flow. Amazing things happen. And I think amazing things can happen for Bonds of Mara. And it's not just their approach. They're a great band. And they put on a great show. And they were crushing it up there to 40 people. Because they're pros, man. And because they love playing together. And the show was great. It was tight. It was loud. It was, you know, so much energy. And I respect the hell out of those guys for doing this. For putting that band together and getting back out there on the road, and doing the grind, and humbling themselves. That is a lesson, kids. That is a lesson to everybody, that you're never, you're never too big. You know, you're never too good for something. And if you want something, you're willing to do the grind. So my purest admiration and respect go to Bonds of Mara. And those dudes hung around after the show, Hung around and shook every hand, took every picture, gave every hug. Gotta respect that, man, because you know bands that don't do that, you know bands that are too good for that, and I really, really uh, appreciated that. I love their show. I think they're great dudes, and I hope for them every success, and I think they'll get it because the frame of mind is right and the gratitude is right and the energy is right. So kudos to them. And you should go check out Bonds of Mara on the road. They're still in Ontario for a little bit. I'm going to put a video probably on my website with the show notes here, J O H N dash H U F F dot com slash podcast and go check them out. And I think I'll link to Sal's Ted talk too, man, because there's a lot in there, a lot of wisdom about, refinding yourself and everybody goes through these periods man where you kind of you lose yourself a little bit i've gone through them i've gone through them particularly as a writer falling apart and you know full disclosure i have not recovered from writing and I'll, maybe i'll talk about that sometime maybe i won't but uh, i have not recovered that part of me and it hurts everybody goes through that so go listen to Sal's TED Talk and pay attention to Bonds of Mara, man. There's a spirituality infused in that band. The name is drawn from the Dhammapada, Mara being uh, the sort of word for unenlightenment or blindness, I guess, or, you know, ignorance, you know. And this band is about freeing yourself from the Bonds of Mara. Finding enlightenment, finding yourself. That's cool, man. There's an extra depth, man. Extra divinity, and I really appreciate that. You know, I was going to talk about other stuff today. But Bonds of Mara got me going, and we're almost 50 minutes into this thing, and that's enough. Is that not enough? Aren't you sick of listening to me by now? I'm going to talk about one more thing Maybe I'll touch more on it on a subsequent episode. And I have not framed this episode as a five things kind of deal. But if you are looking for something to check out, I'm presuming you've listened to the Sarah Harmer record and found it good. I'm presuming you've listened to the Archers of Loaf single and found it good. This time, I'm suggesting you go on the Netflix and you check out the Woodstock documentary. Now, I could probably do a whole half hour on this. I'm not going to. I'm a student of history, I have a degree in history, and there was something sublime and magical about Woodstock. The 1969 Woodstock, the real Woodstock, where they didn't burn the place to the freaking ground, 1999 people. The real Woodstock was a moment in time. It was really a cultural moment. And there's this documentary about it on Netflix. It's about an hour and a half long. Fascinating. Fascinating. And it is so cool just to look at the video footage from that weekend. Woodstock was really, really something. So I'm going to recommend you go look at the Woodstock documentary 
super fascinating stuff, man. Like, they were not expecting 400,000 people. And, you know, they had one place ready to go, one location for it. And then at the last minute, people pulled out because they didn't want all these hippies. They didn't want all these hippies in our neighborhood. We don't like the thought of all these kids coming, so we're out. They pulled the plug on it. And they had to scramble to find another place, like within a few weeks, to put on this three-day festival. And the timing was such, at that point, that they didn't even get a chance to finish the security wall. Right? So they're expecting whatever, 100,000 people maybe? And maybe they sold that many tickets? I don't know. No security wall. People just started coming from miles around. And they'd be like calling people. Dude, there's no fence. There's no way to know if you have a ticket or not. Suddenly there's 400,000 hippies in this kind of natural amphitheater watching Jimi Hendrix play the guitar. You know, like this, it became way beyond all expectation. And it was a festival of peace and love, man. Like it's possible to do that. Can you imagine? 400,000 people, everybody tripped out on LSD, no issues, no incidents, you know? And the organizers of this thing were just like, let them come. Let them come. We'll take a bath. We're making a statement here. We're saying that these kids can get together and not cause any problems. We are the evidence, you know, that give peace a chance is real and works. So you just let them come, whether they paid or not. Let them come. 400,000 people. And they ran out of food. Because they weren't, Jesus wasn't there with the loaves and fishes for crying out loud. They ran out of food. And the people from the neighboring towns and cities got wind that all these kids were starving at the Woodstock. And they started trucking in food. They were raiding their refrigerators and pantries and they gave all the food to the people because they were kids and they didn't want them to starve. Can you imagine what a moment this was? This is a real cultural eye point. This is a real cultural, this is capital H history, man. It is a fascinating documentary. So go watch it. It's really, really something. And maybe I'll talk more about that. I'm not sure. But it's Saturday night. I got my coffee whiskey. TFC blew it. Arsenal fell apart. The Habs are not going to make the playoffs. And that's all the talking I'm going to do, kids. Check out the Woodstock documentary. Don't hate me for actually liking playing some of these country songs. And for crying out loud, get behind Bonds of Mara because uh, that band deserves your support, all right? Now, there's not going to be an episode next week. (gasps) I know it hurts. I know it hurts. But straight up, dude, I've done now 40 episodes in the past year, um, knocking them out with fairly regular consistency. A bit dicey when I've been on the road, but I've tried hard. And I'm taking next week off, man. So take that time to catch up on some of the ones that you've missed. And send me a line. Send me a note. Let me know what you think. Let me know what I should check out and some of the things I should look at. And uh, enjoy the week off, you know? Let's just enjoy the week off. And I'll be back. And we'll see where the show goes from here. I. I was about to say I didn't expect to get this far. That's not necessarily true. But 40 episodes, I have some reflecting to do as well. So I'm going to do that next week. And then we'll be back and then we'll see what happens. But until then, keep your stick on the ice, folks. Go check out that stuff. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Listen to good music. Eat good food. Drink good cognac. Love each other. Enjoy. Indulge. And do the work, man. Do the work. 40 people this time, 200 next time. Do the work. I'm going to do the work. I'll be back real soon. And have a good one, kids. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. If you want to know more about the program, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com and click on podcast. 
You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at JWS Huff. No matter where you listen to the show, please do me a big, big favor and leave a rating and review. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you and remember... Good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. I don't know. Got nothing else to say.